Praise God, brothers and sisters. And I'm praying that we have some brothers listening to our women's Bible study. Because we are discussing sexual impurities. Both men and women have been violated. I was looking for the right word, you know, but the right word would be violated. In our culture today, and during the past, and it's time for us to try to heal some of the pain, that emotional, mental anguish that many feel due to the violation. Amen? If you're a person who has never been sexually violated, it may be hard for you to believe these issues, you know, because many people are under the impression that when men or women are physically raped, sodomized, that they did something to cause this. And the perpetrator drives, thrives on having his victim believe that this is so. But it is not necessarily so. Amen? So, before I get into our lesson for today, I want us to turn to Psalm 51, 10 to 13. And I want you to read these verses on your own. Over and over until you start feeling healing within yourself. And I'm going to read 51, 10 to 13, which says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners shall be converted to you. Amen. Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Amen. And we're going into 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. And I'm sorry, I said 3 through 4, which says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Amen. And now turn with me to Galatians 5, 19 through 21. That's Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outburst of wrath, selfish ambition, dissension, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, revivory, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. First, see that no one 
renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. Amen. So we're not supposed to try to take revenge against people that hurt us. Hebrews 12.15 Looking carefully, at least anyone falls short of the grace of God. Test any root of bitterness, bringing up, cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So, let's remember, sisters and brothers, allow God to take vengeance for us. Because we are children of God, and he will do just that. Rape is a horrible, devastating experience. Most people want to forget. They don't want to even report it. They don't want to go into the trouble of people knowing what happened to them. And they also feel that they can just wash the filth that they're feeling away. Victims may even find themselves in a life-threatening situation. The feelings of humiliation, helplessness, fear, and anger permeates their being. With date rape, women are not only physically and emotionally violated, but the pain is inflicted by someone they trust and with whom they are socially involved most of the time, but not in today's world. The story of Tamar in 2 Samuel 13 offers some solace. Tamar was sexually assaulted by someone she knew, then cast aside like dirt. That is often how a woman who has experienced date rape feels, dirty. She often asks herself, how could I have been so foolish to trust them? She is left feeling very alone and ashamed to look at herself. She may feel as though she has no one to whom she can trust, she can talk to. She may feel too ashamed to tell anyone. There are days when she just wants to scream, scream until the anger disappears or until her voice is no longer audible. And there are days when she feels depressed and just wants to die. Most of the time, women end up with post-traumatic distress, depending on the perpetrator. Amen? And there are so many people today, even mental health workers, that do not believe in that diagnosis. But, but brothers and sisters, it does exist. Other Christian women may try to soothe her by reminding her that God will never put on you more than you can bear, or by saying, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. This doesn't always work. At those times, words are not enough. What is needed is a breakthrough, inner peace, and an elevation of one low as it can go, self-esteem. A term in the Christian church that one hears but really gives much thought to is purge. To purge means to rid one of guilt and defilement, to be free from impurity. Only God can purge the woman who has experienced date rape. As you read God's holy and healing words, you rediscover the sense of security that is often destroyed when one has been physically and emotionally violated. In Psalm 91, the psalmist encouraged himself by recalling the great, awesome power of God to protect and deliver his own from the evil that may befall them. As you read this psalm, allow the word to become personal. Talk to God as the psalmist did, allowing the cleansing power of God's word to wash over your heart and soul. Turn with me to Ephesians 5.26. 
and it reads, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Amen. Let God's promise of security and protection release the dam full of frustration, pain, guilt, fear, memory, and stolen innocence within her. As you cry, pray. As you pray, yield. This is purging. Let's go to Psalm 51 and 7. Purge me with Hesa, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Amen. Are you tired of carrying the guilt? Are you tired of feeling undeserving of true love? Not really knowing how to love yourself? Yield to God's empowering spirit that he might present it to himself a glorious woman, not having spots or wrinkles or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 27. When you find yourself reflecting on a negative path, speak about and speak out loud. The affirmation that God has made you a little lower than the angels crowned you with glory and honor. Psalms 8 and 5. Praise God each day for the healing of your spirit and for the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 1 through 2. You cannot control the actions of others, but with God's love dwelling inside of you, you will endure. And so, I want you to read 2 Samuel 13, Psalm 51, 10 through 13, Romans 8, 28, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, Galatians 5, 19 to 21, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 15, and Hebrews 12, 15. These are healing scriptures that will help release the pain because if you don't do something about the pain that you're feeling the pain will get worse so I'm going to turn right now to 2 Samuel 13 and we're going to talk about Tamar David had a son named Absalom and a son named Ammon Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar, and Amnon loved her. Tamar was a virgin. Amnon made himself sick just thinking about her because he could not find any chance to be alone with her. Amnon had a friend named Jonadab, son of Shimna, David's brother. Jonadab was a very clever man. He asked Amna, son of the king, why do you look so sad day after day? Tell me what's wrong. Amna told him, I love Tamar, the sister of my half-brother Absalom. Jonadab said to Amna, go to bed and act as if you are sick. Then your father will come to you. Tell him, Please let my sister Tamar come in and give me food to eat. Let her make the food in front of me so I can watch and eat it from her hand. So Amnon went to bed and acted sick. When King David came in to see him, Amnon said to him, Please let my sister Tamar come in. Let her make two of her special cakes for me while I watch. Then I will eat them from her hand. David sent for Tamar in the palace, saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and make some food for him. So Tamnar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was in bed. Tamnar took some dough and pressed it together with her hand. She made some special cakes for Amnon watched. Then she baked them. Next she took the pan and served him, but he refused to eat. He said to his servant, All of you leave me alone. So they all left him alone. Abner said to Tamar, 
bring the food into the bedroom so I may eat from your hand. Tamna took the cake she had made and brought them to her brother Amnon in the bedroom. She went to him so he could eat from her hand. But Amnon grabbed her. He said, Sister, come and have sexual relations with me. Tamna said to him, No, brother, don't force me. This should never be done in Israel. Don't do this shameful thing. I could never get rid of my shame. And you will be like the shameful fool in Israel. Please talk with the king and he will let you marry me. But Amnon refused to listen to her. He was stronger than she was, so he forced her to have sexual relations with him. After that, Abna hated Tamar. He hated her more than he had loved her before. Abna said to her, Get up and leave. Tamar said to him, No, sending me away would be worse than what you've already done. But he refused to listen to her. He called his young servant back in and said, Get this woman out of here and away from me. Lock the door after her. So his servant led her out of the room and bolted the door after her. Tamar was wearing a special robe with long sleeves because the king's virgin daughter wore this kind of robe. To show how upset she was, Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her special robe and put her hand on her head. Then she went away crying loudly. Absalom, Tabna's brother, said to her, Has Amna, your brother, forced you to have sexual relations with him? For now, sister, be quiet. He is your half-brother. Don't let this upset you so much. So Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house and was sad and lonely. When King David heard the news, he was very angry. Absalom did not say a word, God, good or bad, to Amnon, but he hated Amnon for disgracing his sister Tamnon. David's family was in conflict. His eldest son Amnon raped Tamar, his own half-sister. Absalom, Tamnon's brother, murdered Ammon in revenge. Sexual sin produces disastrous consequences in family. Amen. What do you do with your failures? Our mistakes come to us as pebbles, small stones that serve as souvenirs of our stumble. Here are some failures that have been drugged into my office. Unfaithfulness. He wanted to try again. She said, no way. He wanted a second chance. She said, you blew your chance. He admitted that he made a mistake by seeing another woman. He sees now that the mistake was fatal to his marriage. That's one scenario. Another scenario is he was physically abusive to her. He made the mistake of pulling, pushing, dragging her. But he never asked for forgiveness. He just assumed that his wife was going to forgive him. When he came before her and she said, you know we're getting a divorce. He could not even ask why, but again, he still did not ask for forgiveness. Homosexuality. His wrist bored the scars of a suicide attempt. His arm had tracked from countless needles. His eyes reflected the spirit of one 
hell-bent on self-destruction. His words were those of a prisoner, grimly resented or resigned to the judge's sentence. I'm gay, my dad says. I'm queer. I guess he's right. Immorality. She came to church with a pregnant womb and a repentant spirit. I can't have a child, she pleaded. We'll find a home for it, she was assured. She agreed. Then she changed her mind. Her boyfriend found the abortion or her boyfriend funded the abortion. Can God ever forgive me, she asked. Could you do it all over again? You do it differently? You be a different person? You be more patient? You control your tongue? You finish what you started? You turn the other cheek instead of slapping his? You get married first? You wouldn't marry at all? You be honest? You resist the temptation? But you can't. And as many times as you tell yourself, what's done is done. What you did can't be undone. That's part of what Paul meant when he said, the wages of sin is death. He didn't say, the wages of sin is a bad mood. Or, the wages of sin is a hard day. Nor, the wages of sin is depression. Read it again. The wages of sin is death. Sin is fatal. Can anything be done with it? What do you do with the stones from life's stumble? My oldest daughter, Gina, is four years old. Some time ago, she came to me with a confession. Daddy, I took a crayon and threw on the wall. Kids amazed me with their honesty. I sat down and lifted her up into my lap and tried to be wise. Is that a good thing to do? I asked her. No. What does daddy do when you write on the wall? You spank me. What do you think daddy should do this time? Love. Don't we all want that? Don't we all long for a father who, even though our mistakes are written all over the wall, will love us anyway? Don't we want a father who cares for us in spite of our failures? We do have that type of father. A father who is at his best when we are at our worst. A father whose grace is strongest when our devotion is weakest. If your bag is bulky, then you're in the for some thrilling news. Your failures are not fatal. Amen. And I'm going to say that again. Your failures are not fatal. So what price have you paid for sin? Remember, God does not want you to live in guilt or defeat. Embrace Christ for healing and hope. Trust Christ for tomorrow and faith. Begin to heal wounds today. Amen. And I'm going to read some scriptures to help us along our way in closing. Amen. These scriptures are for anyone needing comfort due to the pain of abuse. And I would appreciate if you read them and you continue to read them for as long as needed. But I would say for 90 days because it takes three months for change to begin in us. Amen.